So uh, yeah, I'm I'm Colby. Um, some of you I know that know me, but uh, to those that uh, don't, uh, I work on applied cryptography. Um, I do a lot of work on Scylla, and um, part of the work I've been doing uh, with Scylla is uh, is the Pluma Ultralight client, uh, which is a SNARK accelerated uh, light client that op that's optimized for mobile phones. Uh, but today, the talk is actually about Espero, which is the system we've built for doing a good and efficient SNARK setup for this Pluma Ultralight client. Right. So before we get into the setup itself, I want to give a little bit of a Pluma recap just to, to give the motivation of the tools that we're using and the different curves and all of these kind of things. So let's do that. In general, we, we know how light clients work. And if we quickly recall in proof of work, light clients, what you do is you download the headers. And then what you do is you verify the proof of work on those headers. And then you assume that this is enough, uh, assuming, um, assuming general math works that you get reasonable security if you verify just the proof of work headers. And that works uh, nicely, especially if you don't have a lot of headers. Um, so maybe contrasting Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, for how long the header chain is. Um, and you also have some efficient methods um, to, to do it more quickly, where, like Flight Client and Nipopal, where you can probabilistically just get just verify less blocks or less headers and still get reasonable security. But when you jump to the proof of stake world where you have, let's say, BFT style protocols, where you have 100 validators and these validators sign each block, let's say you need two thirds of the validators to sign each block, then it becomes a bit harder because you don't really have a single chain to follow, uh, you just have a bunch of signatures on blocks. So forks are in some way harder to create because you need to break honesty of large, like honesty that is hard to break, like two thirds of the validators should be okay. But in some other way, it's, it's uh, annoying because now you can use things like flight client at least for some BFT style systems. So what can you do? So the first thing that we should talk about is how a naive proof of stake light client would look like. And that would be sort of what I was alluding to. So let's say that you want to verify your balance. Let's say it's an Ethereum style blockchain where each block has the current state root and the state root, for example, contains um, leaves that are balances of users. Let's take that as an example. So let's say that I want to know my balance. I need to sync to the latest state of the chain. And in order to do that, I need to download each and every block um, and verify the signatures by the validators to see that the validators agreed uh, on what is the validator set and what that this block is valid. So assuming, for example, that the validator is set changes every block, then you need to verify every block. But usually you don't really have to do that uh, practically. So what some blockchains, including Celo do, is that you do validator elections once per epoch, where an epoch is some amount of blocks, where in Celo it's about a day. It's like 17,000 blocks given five second block times. So the first thing that you can understand from this is that if you really want to check something within an epoch, like to, to check your balance, you don't really have to verify every block in this one epoch. You really need to make sure that the validator set that you know is the most current one. And to know that, all you need to know is that the last validator election that happened at the end of the previous epoch happened correctly. 
And then after you do that, you know what is the current value of set. So then you can take any block throughout the epoch and verify its validity because it's signed by two thirds of the validator set that you know is the current one. And when you know that, you can continue as is usual. So this is what we call epoch-based syncing. So first of all, you don't need to download all the blocks. You just need to download all the epoch blocks. And then whenever you want to make a lifeline query, you download the block, verify the signatures according to the, to the validator set in this epoch, and you're good. Now, the next thing you want to optimize is um, the amount of signatures. So let's say you have 100 validators and you need two thirds, so like 67 validators have to sign at least. And what that means is that you would have, if you use VCDSA, for example, you would have 67 ECDSA signatures, which is not ideal. But what you can do using BLS signatures, you can non-interactively aggregate them and then have one single signature. All right. Now, the next thing is you still need to download every epoch block, and that is not ideal for mobile phones or for resource-constrained uh, environments. So what we figured out is that, all right, instead of having live clients actually running this protocol of downloading every epoch block and verifying the signatures, what we can do is we can write a snark that does exactly that, verifies uh, the signatures and outputs what is the most current validator set. And that's exactly what Plomo is. Plomo is this snark that takes a bunch of epochs and does the signature verification and validator set transition. And that's uh, what's needed in order to create a single proof that takes you from some initial validator set to the current validator set. Uh, all right. So quickly going over what we check. So we need to check that the validator set together with a bitmap that's saying which validators participated, because not all of them have to sign, only two thirds. And um, which so aggregating the BLS public key according to this bitmap, check that more than two thirds signed, check that the epoch number or let's say block number is exactly the block number that is expected, which is the next one after the previous epoch. Um, then you need to do all of the BLS signature verification. So you need to do this encode, uh, encode it to bits and then hash to group. And that's uh, a bit hard because you now have to hash like a hundred validator public keys and that's about a 14 kilobyte message. So called the kilobit message, so that's pretty um, large. And then you check a BLS signature essentially, like a big aggregate BLS signature across the epochs. So that's basically the Plomo snark. Now in order to facilitate that, because normally you cannot efficiently verify pairings inside the snark, we use this two chain from that was originally introduced in the Zexi paper, but was then improved by uh, EY, and I know I saw that Yusuf got in the talk. Uh, he's one of the creators of BW6, uh, which is a two-chain in the sense that in the, in, the, in the snark that's written on BW6, you can write statements that verify pairings on BLS 12.377, and so if you have BLS signatures on BLS 12.377, you're good, and you can verify it inside the snark. So that's the curve that Plomo uses, essentially. It uses BW6 for itself. So let's, since the last talk in ZK Summit, like previously, we gave a talk about Plomo, and some things that changed is that we moved from SW6 that was introduced in Zexi to BW6, and some architecture changes that are, make all this construction more amenable to slashing. And some, uh, we have this future subcommittee attack that we've seen, so all of this prevention. And if you attended Pratusha's talk from yesterday about artworks, so we also use the artwork style gadgets. Basically, Plo is written 
over the artworks framework. All right, so this was um, an introduction or a recap of Pluma to give them motivation for a sparrow. So why we need it and what it is essentially. And a sparrow, oh, just a second. Oops. Sorry, I'm losing my... Okay. So a sparrow is essentially... Um, it's an end-to-end -end system for performing optimistic setups, which we'll cover what it means soon, that is optimized for large circuits, um, and especially for circuits that are um, as large as the Plumo circuit. Um, it aims to be end-to-end, uh, -end, including verification tools and so on. And the name itself, Espero, it means hope, or in Esperanto, uh, in some way. And it's a play of words on it's a play of words on uh, on optimistic, I guess. So before we we dive really deep into what Espero does. I want to remind all of us what it means to do a trusted setup, what what we actually compute. So in order to do that, let's switch gears and go into doing some drawing. All right. So what, what do we compute in a trusted setup? So let's say that I'm some participant, P. Uh, so what I have, I generate Let's talk about the subset of the setup, okay? So I generate a secret tau, which is a field element. And what I want to output um, is something that looks like this. I want to output powers of tau, but hidden. So I'm given a generator of the elliptic curve, and I want to output tau, tau squared times g, and up until some predefined power, which is pretty large, let's say n equals 2 to the 28. And I want to compute all of these. So that's what I do, let's say, as the first participant. So let's say this is tau 1. And now, um, as the second participant, I'm getting this. And what I am computing is I'm taking each element and I have my own secret tau2 and I multiply my tau2 by all the previous elements. So I do this, I do this, and so on. And yeah. And as a result, what I'm getting is, you know, we, we can write this a bit differently. We can write it as follows, right? We can do exactly this. So essentially, I'm getting, after we do a lot of participants, I'm getting this tau, which is tau1 times tau2 times tau_m, And I'm getting an SRS, like a structured reference string, which looks like this, with this combined tau, which is the product of everything. And this is, for example, um, a subset of what you do in Roth 16, and also in Marlin or Plonk-like setups. So that's what you do in a setup. So this is what you want to compute, and this is how you you usually do it, you have a coordinator, and the coordinator initializes the ceremony, they create some initial setup, they pass it to the first participant, they add randomness, then you go to the second participant, and you continue, and so on. So that's how it usually works. Um, 
and eventually you get your SRS and it's enough that one party is honest for this whole thing to be secure. I know there are some like more details like you, do you need a random beacon and all things like that, but let's not get into that right now. So, so that's kind of the model. All right. Going back to the setup itself, now I described what it, a normal setup looks like from the point of view of participants, but what I didn't describe is how do I verify that this protocol ran correctly. And in the sense that we have a coordinator that passes the challenges or the SRSs from participant to participant, but we don't want to have any trust in the coordinator because that would kind of defeat the purpose because then we have a single trusted party. So what we really want to do is we, have, we want to have a coordinator which is untrusted so that we can verify anything that it's doing. So let's find out what exactly this coordinator is doing. So first of all, what we want to verify is what we call proofs of knowledge. And actually, let's go back to this. And the proofs of knowledge mean that if I'm computing tau times g, I actually need to prove to other participants, or to the world, to the coordinator, that I know what tau is. And maybe people that are kind of familiar with rogue key attacks, it's maybe a good analogy, because if you don't verify that you know that the person that participated knows the tau, then the participant might craft some bad contributions that would cancel other contributions. And that would be pretty bad because you want to make sure that no participant can cancel another's. That's how you get the one person honesty. Uh, okay. The second thing you want to verify is that any of these tau ig are not zero or infinity. Because if it's going to be zero, then any operation you're going to, to perform on it later is going to leave it zero and this whole thing is just not useful anymore. And the next thing is you want to verify subgroup membership, uh, which means that where we, when we're doing the setup, um, then we're working in a subgroup of the entire elliptic curve. So we're working in a prime order subgroup and what can go wrong if we are not in this subgroup? So let's say that we have tau times g, which is a generator of the subgroup, but some small, let's say, order three element, t, then if I get this, then I get something of this sort, t mod three times t, and then as someone who receives it, I can just try maybe subtracting um, zero, subtracting T, subtracting two T, and whenever I succeed in getting back into the subgroup, this is like a small subgroup, uh, small, um, uh, yeah, I forgot that, but small uh, subgroup of that, that essentially you can discover some information about the secret, about tau, and that's, not idea, like you can discover tau mod 3 here, which is not so good. And you want to prevent that. Okay. So that's the next thing you do. Now, another thing you want to verify is the ratios. And what do I mean by ratios? So I have tau and I have tau squared and I have um, tau cubed. So I want to verify that when I, I divide, in quotes, uh, this by this, then I get the same thing as if I divide this tau cube by tau squared is the same as tau squared by tau. Um, and you can do that using some pairing, but you really want to do that because you really need these things to be powers of tau and consecutive powers. And if it's in, incorrect, then the SRS will not be useful to create growth 16 proofs, for example. So that's what you want to verify. All right. 
Now, the last thing is that I didn't draw is you want to verify an attestation, or what does that mean? So let's say that I'm a participant in the setup, and let's say that the coordinator says that, yeah, Kobe participated, that's, that's great, and this is their contribution. Um, but if I don't publicly say that, yes, this is what I got as a challenge, as an input, and this is what I output as a response, like this is my output, then people can't really be certain that the coordinator didn't lie. So I need to attest as a participant that, yes, this is what I got. These are the hashes that I got as an input. This is the hashes that I output. And if I do that, then people can be more confident that I, Kobe, actually personally worked on this part of the setup. And what I want to, to do is to go over some history of setup and show how it was done there to see what we are doing. And let's start with, uh, with one of the most famous setups, which is Zcash Sprout. And that was for the Pinocchio proving system, PGHR 13, uh, on BN 254. It involved six people, it involved a few stages, and it was quite involved. People had to boot some a special operating system and burn DVDs between different computers. There was an automatic coordinator system that uh, I think Sean built, but also I think he also monitored it very closely. Um, People drove to remote locations, and there was uh, a lot of, inf it was quite complex to run it. Um, and there is a tool that allows you to verify the transcript, which is the combination of all the operations of all the people, that allows you to see that the coordinator operated correctly. It was for a specific circuit. It was for the Zika Sprout circuit. And it took, from what I've read, and uh, remember, is like 27 hours. Uh, end to end for six people. And the next one is Zcash Sapling, which was for the Growth 16 proving system. And that was on BLS 12 381. This time they had two phases one which is called Powers of Tau, which was generic for every circuit up until a certain size. It had 87 participants, it ran for about three months. Then uh, there was another phase, which is the phase two, the specific for the sampling circuit, 90 participants, three months. And this time it was manual. Like there was no automatic coordinator that people can just run and that's it. There was a human coordinator operating over the mailing list. And people would sign up and they would attest to their hashes on the mailing list and they would also publish some attestations and this is one of the famous attestations by Andrew Miller that uh, he went to to Chernobyl and got some uh, some actual toxic waste and uh, got randomness from it to see the the secret value uh, I, I think this is a Geiger counter I don't know but uh, this is what happened there um, but yeah, people got creative and did some interesting um, side channel prevention mechanisms. And this is um, what Zcash Sapling was. Another interesting one is the S recognition, which was a bit smaller than other setups in some respects. So it was large in the amount of power as you needed but it also it contained only G1 powers. So growth 16 includes, let's say, tau powers in G1, but also some other alpha, random alpha times the tau powers in G1, and then beta times tau in G1, and so on. So this was a pretty large setup uh, with a different construction. All right, 
So this had more participants, like 176, and it took only 32 days. And it also was pretty nice that you could, I think it had pipelining of network and compute in the sense that while you were downloading the challenge you are going to work on, you are already computing uh, the ones that you are downloaded. So you save some time. And that stations in this case, I think addresses and signatures were involved. So you had uh, an address, an Ethereum address attached to your identity. And Aztec had uh, an automatic coordinator, which was pretty nice. You just needed as a participant to boot your participation software, leave it running, and when your turn arrives, it would contribute, and that's it. Um, then there is the Perpetual Powers of Tau that is run by uh, Wegia, which I think is also uh, in the talk. Um, and this one works, is a pretty big setup. It's 2 to 28 powers on growth 16, so it's pretty large. And it's still running for more than a year. It has about 58 participants, and there is manual coordination, um, which means by email. Uh, yeah. Or Telegram. There is an active Telegram group where it happens. Another one is the Tornado setup, uh, where it used for its phase one the perpetual powers of Tau, and for phase two it used um, some version of uh, Wasm compatible phase two implementation, and they ran it in a browser. So they had an automated browser setup. You can go into a website and uh, just run the setup. I think it was a coordinator which was um, hoping that there are no collisions. So contribution there, because the circuit is pretty small, about two to the 18 uh, gates, then you could compute it in a few seconds, your contribution. Um, in contrast, for example, the perpetual powers of tower, it takes hours. Um, even more than half a day for some people. And here it was a few seconds, so people would just contribute, and if there was no collision between people, then they their contribution was verified and continued. And then there was the Falcon, which is both 16 on the S12381, also pretty large, 50, 20 participants in each phase and circuit. They have a few circuits and a manual coordinator. And uh, I think this is the last I have in my examples, which is the semaphore phase two setup uh, for the semaphore circuit. Again, the perpetual powers of tau uh, was the input as phase one. Uh, phase two is growth 16 of the semaphore circuit. And it was an automated setup. Uh, it's based on the ignition um, ceremony uh, software that, and it had about 51 participants. Okay. Now, this sounds like very complex and a lot of people are investing a lot of effort into doing all these setups. Why are we still doing them? Like, this is very annoying. Why? Why are we doing them? And there are a few reasons. So one is the proving time. Proving time is still pretty good with all of these systems. So that's one reason. Like, you can run them, run them on browsers, run them on phones, and it's pretty good. But maybe more importantly, uh, verification time and proof sizes are very small. You know, some might say it's like constant size. Um, and verification time for Growth 16 is pretty good. And if you look at gas cost, it's about 200K gas uh, for verifying Growth 16 proofs. Uh, so that's pretty good. And the proof size is two G1 elements and one G2 element, which is very small. And if you have a um, universal setup or universal proving system like Plunk and Marlin, um, then you don't have to do more than one setup, or at least more than one setup, assuming that you trust one of the people in that setup was not as. Um, and I guess like I'm reading Kev's question in the chat, um, then, yeah, you don't really need to do 
different ceremonies if you use the same curve and the same base field you can reuse it for universal system again like, exactly like what Alistair said in the chat which is any KCG polycommitment base scheme right and what's different about the setups that we've seen in the history like the Zcash ones from the beginning and the setups that we see today and the difference is that we see that some setups are just much larger for like larger amount of constraints than we used to have. So the, the um, perpetual powers of time is for two to the 28 powers. So it's pretty large, right? And yeah, so let's talk about a sparrow. And the Sparrow, to remind, is this system that we've developed in C Labs to do um, setups for large circuits, especially for Plumo. That's what it was tailored for. And you maybe some of you have seen this uh, comic strip from XKCD. So, like, if we have a bunch of setup systems, well, why do we need another one? Um, I'll try to convince you why maybe we need another one or why it's good to have it. Uh, so, this is uh, some details about what it gives you. So, this is work that we, based on work that we've done in the past with uh, Georgios that um, created some pretty good setup code base. It's based in spirit on the Zcash and Metro Lab code bases. Um, and one of the main things that we do here is we have, we use an observation that's been noticed by Justin and Vitalik on if research to do some optimization. And let me recap, let, let me show that later, actually. All right. So what we can do using this observation is we can run the setup somewhat in parallel or concurrent. That's a good question. What's the right term here? As long as they work on different shops. So let's see what that means. So let's say that we have to compute a bunch of powers. Let's say from tau to the zeroth power to the hundred and then to the 200 and then 300 and if we want to compute, let's say that we have participants one and participant two, this one has tau one and this one has tau two. So let's say that I as participant one work on this chunk of powers that is comprised of the parts from zero to hundred. So what I would do when I get the initial input that just contains the generators, um, what I would compute is the following. I would take my tau one tau to the zeroth power and do times g, and tau one to the hundredth power times g. And the second participant working on this second chunk would do the same, but for different powers. Okay. But now let's observe something nice that now let's say that we continue and we switch places. Now I work or participant one works on the 100 to the 200. And then what they compute is the following. Let's say for the first element and in the same way, what we compute here is, for the last element, is going to be this. And since this is what we do in a setup, this is all commutative. So there is no problem in switching the order. Like, this has the same meaning in, as this, right? Like, there's no problem doing this. So the observation is that we can execute things out of order while participant one works on the first chunk, participant two can work on the second chunk and so on. So this is 
in some way you, you can parallelize. So this is what we meant here when we said that you can run setup in parallel for the participants as long as they work on different jobs. And another thing that's uh, being when we design the Sparrow is that it's optimized for large setups. So it doesn't require you to have large amounts of RAM. This can run on one gigabyte RAM or two gigabytes. It's, it's enough. Like you don't need more than that, even if the SRS is 70 or 100 gigabytes. That's not a problem. Um, and one other thing that we felt was important is having end to end verification tools. So you can receive a single JSON file. And using the JSON file, you can verify the entire operation of the ceremony using these verification tools. And another really nice thing that I'm really happy about is that since this is based on what used to be Zexy, the Zexy codebase, which is now called Arcworks, um, then it supports any curve that Arcworks supports. So if you Arcworks supports like a bunch of curves, like BN254, BL12, 381, BL12, 377. Um, and you can do a setup on any of these, especially for Pluma when we use BW6. And, and you can use any curve that it supports. So um, this is recapping what we've seen in, in drawing. You can divide the SRS, this structure reference string, into chunks. The order when you contribute into channels doesn't matter, but there is a disadvantage. Like this is, there is no free lunch. And you have a problem if someone, for example, drops in the middle. So let's say that I computed participant one on five out of 10 chunks, but then I, I'm malicious and I said, eh, I don't want to contribute anymore. So I turn off my computer, I delete my toxic waste, and I just don't participate. But while I was participating, some people already built on my contribution and on the contributions on the chunks that I already contributed to. And what that means is that all of these contributions, you can't use them anymore because no one, nobody knows my toxic waste and therefore they cannot continue to contribute using my randomness. So we need to delete all the, my contributions and all the contributions that rely on it. So you might have like liveness problems, the setup might get stuck, and, which is annoying. But the good, the good thing is that what we've seen in previous setups is that that's not usually the case. Usually the case is that people will have a hard time with the time the setup takes, and they usually have a hard time um, like getting things ready and, and coordinating and things like that, but people are not usually usually malicious, and and moreover, this type of malicious behavior is detectable in contrast to someone who uses bad randomness or colludes with other participants. Here, um, you can know exactly who made the problem. And the worst that can happen is that you need to restart or restart a part of the ceremony. So that's like the trade-offs that you have to take here. And maybe some something that we, we've been thinking about is, all right, let's say that we have someone that is not malicious, but decides that they cannot con continue the setup. The computer doesn't work anymore and they don't have any other machine to work with. And they don't have the capability to work on a cloud machine for some reason. Um, then if they really want to, they can send us their, or send like anyone, their toxic waste and they continue for them. So you lose the security of that participant, like the randomness does not contribute to security anymore, but liveness is maintained. So this is a good trade-off in some sense. Um, specifically for Plomo, which is a 2 to the 27 Roth 16 setup on BW6, which is a pretty large curve. It's like 761 bits, which is much slower than the corresponding, let's say, 381 bits on BLAS 12, 381. We felt that we needed to do more optimization 
So what we've built into Arcworks, or like our fork of Arcworks, is the capability to do batch inversions on, on like a batch of scalar multiplications together. Um, another thing is an assembly implementation or on Intel, like x86, of BW6 uh, arithmetic. Um, another is GLV uh, implementation, which actually now works for almost any carrot in our works. And we also have an experimental GPU support using the Excel library um, because all this is written in Rust and Excel is, seems to be a wonderful library to take Rust code and run it on CUDA supporting hardware, then this also works. So the result of all of this optimized arithmetic is without GPU support is about three to four X performance gain, which is really nice. And what we've found is like, which is a big plus in, plus in working in our works is that optimizations were pretty easy to add uh, generically because our works is so generic. So we really like that. Um, and maybe some more details on the Sparrow itself. So the coordinator that we've described is very simple. And it's simple in the sense that like it, it does some things. It's not, it's, it's smart, but it's simple in the sense that it's not resource intensive. All it does is coordinates participants and make sure that participants don't work on the same chunk at the same time and that participants can lock only a certain amount of chunks and that verifiers, like this, the verifiers that uh, some people run, like the coordinator group runs, and know what they need to verify and manage all this workflow. So it's pretty simple. It's not resource intensive. So that's what we mean by a simple coordinator. Um, and you have scalable verifiers in the sense that you can create as many verifiers as you want and the coordinator just gives them the ability to, to verify um, any contributions that are ready to be verified. And we also work directly against cloud storage, so that resulted in pretty fast download and upload speeds, um, and also does not require any hard infrastructure to deploy. Um, and you may have noticed that now, since we divided the SRS into chunks, and in the case of Pluma, we divided it into 256 chunks, then if I want to do these attestations that we've talked about before, then I would have to publish a lot of hashes, and that's a bit annoying, especially if you want to put it in a single tweet. Then maybe uh, what, what you want to do is instead use signatures, something that is similar to ignition, I think, where you have an address that you attach to your identity. And what you do is you add to the transcript of the ceremony signatures or from that address or from the public key on the hashes of what you got and what you um, responded with. So essentially, once you attest publicly to your address, then people can already be pretty certain that this is exactly this person that worked on these chunks. And one maybe additional last thing that it supports both Growth 16 and Marlin, but actually like it supports just creating SRSs that are for KZG10, but actually it also supports this degree bound um, polynomial commitment, which is uh, nicely described in Aurolite, which you just need to add another login elements to the SRS and you have better degree bound polynomial commitments. So it supports both of these kind of setups. And uh, yeah, I guess like, <laughs> I have some uh, call to action here, is that I've described the Plumo setup, uh, like, yeah, well, when is that happening? So it's happening pretty soon. So I would encourage uh, anyone that is interested to 
read the post about it, uh, and I will send the links somewhere more accessible later. Um, and read the post uh, that's about why we're doing this, which I kind of summarized in the beginning, and sign up uh, to the setup and see what's happening here. Awesome. Um, and uh, looks like uh, Gab put some. Uh, oh, sorry, you're gonna. You're, I interrupted you before you finish. Let me. Yeah, go ahead. just one one last slide. I promise. No problem. Yeah, yeah one last ahead. slide. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, like everybody who's been involved here, which is the cell team, a bunch of people from um, C Labs specifically, and some people from Elio that also contributed to making this setup system work really nicely. And lastly, all the authors of the MPC setups that we base all this work on. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, and Alex, please go ahead with what you were going to say. Oh, I was just going to say thank you, Kobe. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's it's great. This work, I think, lays the foundation for hopefully a lot of other future work in this area. And we'll see this technology uh, become easier to instantiate. And hopefully that will bring a lot of new and interesting applications. So uh, with that, um, I did want to just say, let's maybe turn to questions. And uh, also, I wanted to highlight uh, some of the stuff, the, the resources that Kobe just mentioned have uh, been posted in the chat there. So take a look there. Um, and yeah, there's a couple questions. Maybe I don't know if you can see the chat, Kobe, but uh, looks yeah. like Kev that has uh, has a couple questions, and maybe you can start by addressing those. And then if anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat or raise your hand, and we'll call on you. Cool. Okay, let me go over that. All right. So yeah, Kev was asking, would an attack vector be that I assign myself to the first chunk and then wait for other participants to work on further chunks? Then I abstain from publishing my chunk, making the work of other participants unusable. Uh, yes, this is an attack vector. And this is the trade-off that you have to take here. And uh, that people attach themselves, their identities, to what's happening in the setup. And essentially, if this happens, you have to restart for the chunks that uh, people already built upon. Um, but what you should also do as the coordinator is monitor for any participants that concretely are either not contributing for a lot of time or, um, or um, hold lock chunk for too long of a time and remove them from the setup early on or as fast as possible. But uh, yeah, definitely this is an attack vector. And some, some way that we do to cope with that is to divide the ceremony into rounds. So not only divide it into chunks, but also into rounds. So if you have, let's say, 500 participants, maybe you don't want to run all of them at the same time because then a single malicious participant can hurt the liveness and you would have to restart the ceremony. So what you want to do is divide it into rounds where you have a group, let's say, of 50 people in each round. And then after each round is finished, you do all the verification you need to do. And only then continue to the next round. Now, if someone is bad in the second round, then the output of the first round is not heard. You can continue with it. So you can either remove all the participants from the second round, or you can remove only the malicious participant and continue from there. So this is some way that uh, we mitigate this by dividing uh, the whole setup into rounds. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, are there any other, and does anybody else have any questions? Um, feel free and post here. We'll give it a second because there is some latency between the chat and what we see, Kobe. So uh, feel free and post it if you're in the session. Feel free and post any questions you have in there or raise your hand and we'll just pause here for a few seconds and let that, let those come in. Right, so I see another question uh, by Kev. So can the coordinator verify uh, a chunk is correct before a round is completed? All right, so that's a very good question, and I realize I didn't 
touched on it before. So you can do partial verification. And, and what it means is that, all right, when you work on a single chunk, the, and you get like a contribution on this chunk, then you can verify that points are on the infinity point and you can verify that they're in co the correct subgroup. But what you cannot reliably do is verify the correct ratios because the ratios need to be verified across all the chunks together. And if you don't have all of the contributions from all of the participants, then you cannot reliably verify what happens in the intersection of chunks. And what this means is that you delay the verification of ratios up until the end of a round. And only after you have all the contributions from the different participants in this round, then only then you have, you can do the verification of ratios reliably. So that's what the coordinator can do, yeah. All right, so I think, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I think, two. yeah, two yeah. comments. Uh, so comment from Deira, I don't quite understand the splitting into rounds. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because I went over it really fast. Um, but it's simpler than probably how I described it. So let me try again. So let's assume that I only had 10 participants in the entire setup and they all work in this optimistic manner and they work on different chunks and then it all finishes. All the different 10 participants contributed to all the different chunks and we got our final SRS and we can verify ratios and we can do anything. All right, we can take that SRS and continue from it and or we can continue building on top of that SRS and start another round that has 10 other different participants. So if you imagine how it worked in the mailing list of Sapling, then instead of one person being scheduled at each slot, then you have 10 people scheduled at each slot. That's what I mean by round, I hope that's more clear. Uh, okay, cool. I see that uh, there is, uh, oh, I see, that's good. Light bulbs uh, are, uh, are flickering on. Yeah. So, like, it, it applies to any setup. Like, it doesn't apply only to setups that already use multiple rounds, yeah. Uh, maybe, like, some terminology, like, the different phases in a setup we call phases, and rounds is groups of participants, um, and chunks are, like, slices of this or this. Yeah, okay, cool. Um. Great. Does anyone have any other questions? We probably have time for one more question, uh, if anyone has any. So we'll pause for 10 seconds and let, let that come in if there is one. Yeah, maybe meanwhile I can just say that um, all of this is already open source, like you can already try it out. Uh, and besides uh, contributing to the Pluma ceremony, you can just use it for your own systems. Um, so feel free to, to check it out. I'll send some links. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Kobe. I think, uh, I think that may have been our last question. So with that, I just want to say a big thank you to you and, uh, and to everyone who attended the session and just quickly plug, uh, we have one more talk and one more session. Actually, the next talk on the main stage is lightning talks. And then the next session is going to be, uh, we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about optimizing some of these uh, operations in hardware, these uh, cryptographic operations. And so be a little bit of a, of a change, but I think some very interesting and important work that's going to be presented by uh, the folks at Chain Reaction. So stick around for that. And then, of course, for those of you who hung out at Gather earlier, we're going to do that again. And then we have a special surprise uh, for this time around. So don't miss it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll see you all hopefully in the next session or, or at the after party in, in Gather. Thanks again, Kobe. Thanks, everyone, for attending. See you all later.